conference, I really should be um, kind of opting into the, uh, you know, the, the Game of Thrones idea. So it's sort of, it, it should be a GOT talk instead of an IOT talk. Um, now, I, 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 wanted to make, I wanted to make some kind of elaborate lame joke about Game of Thrones here, but I need to know that nobody's going to be worried about getting a spoiler for the latest season, right? So is, that, is that okay? Everybody's seen the latest season, or you don't care, one or the other, right? Okay. <laughs> good, good, good. So, well, the, well then you know that uh, Hodor gave his life, I mean, literally gave his whole life to holding the, to holding the door. That was, I mean, it wasn't, just, it wasn't just that he died holding the door, but that, um, but that his entire life was given over to the, the proposition. Thank you very much. Uh, well, his entire life was given over, over, to the, to, over to the need to do that. And, uh, and hmm, that's not great. And what I'm doing here is actually... It's not really, here he is actually at the very last moment of his life, literally giving everything to holding the door. And actually what I want to do is, I don't want, I don't, my entire purpose of this talk is to not hold the door. So that's, 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 the, that's, the, idea of the, that's the idea of the talk. And that's, that's the nearest I'll get to a Game of Thrones joke about it as well, I'm afraid. So, um, so just a kind of brief introduction about me, because this is a long talk anyway. And I'm somebody who's written a couple of books about this stuff, and I've... I'm a Java champion, and I speak at Java One and uh, get these awards for doing it. Um, and uh, and the, the thing that you get out of this is that this is not my day job. What I'm going to talk about here is definitely not my day job. I'm a software person, and I get really anxious. You might have seen how anxious I get when it, when it comes to the point of actually getting any hardware to work at all. So, so that's why I say if, I, if anybody... Um, if I can do this, then, any, then anybody can do it. <clears throat> this is the first computer I ever worked on. I like to put this up because it's sort of, I feel like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm almost proud now about how old I am. If you can be proud of sort of having stayed alive, I suppose, up to this point. I actually, uh, uh, I actually played, I didn't actually program this computer, but I worked on it. It was attached to a, to a very, very early version of a magnetic res resonance image spectrometer that, uh, that I was doing research on a long time ago. And this, the, the spectrometer was, the um, magnetic fields of that spectrometer were so weak that it took an in the whole night to acquire a spectrum uh, of, uh, of uh, samples that had to be very carefully prepared, very different from the magnetic resonance imaging today. And the reason I mention this is because you, you, I just sat and looked at this thing all, you know, for like eight hours in the middle of the night, and I, just, and I discovered on this my very first computer game. So that was like 19, it's the early 1970s, and it was a duck shooting game. And I remember it particularly because like, this, was, this was very exciting, and it passed uh, the long hours of the night. Um, you, you had to hit the space bar and a little bullet would go up and, 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 and shoot an ASCII duck that flew across the screen. 4, 000, 4, 4K words, that, that's what, what it had. Um, it, that's, that was our model, 4K, 16-bit words. And 40 years later, a Java one, um, not, not this one just gone by, but a year ago, Oracle made a nice present to me of a Raspberry Pi, um, which, I mean, it's just a, a nice thing that they, that they do sometimes. Uh, thank you, Oracle, but like, what do I do with this thing? So it sat on my desk and gathered dust, the way actually most people's Raspberry Pis do when they, when, when they first get them. And in the long months of the winter, I kind of thought, well, yeah, I just could have looked at this thing. And I thought, is this going to gather dust forever? And it might have been very likely to do that. I think it's, I think it's really nice, actually, to look at the contrast between these, between these, two, um, between these two machines. Um, the, this one which was very expensive for its time. And what, what, what we have now is pretty good. So, um, so what, I, what I thought I'd have a shot at doing was talking to my front door with it. So I live, in a, I live on Baclou Place, named after the, the um, built in the 1780s, and named after the largest landowner in Scotland, the Duke of Baclou, at, the, in, at that time. So I'll leave it to you to guess who is currently the largest landowner in Scotland, 230 years later. But uh, the, the, the clue is in the name. It's still the Duke of a clue. Not the same one, obviously. <clears throat> so this is a very nice street in Edinburgh. And Edinburgh is a great place. Strongly recommend a visit. You look down my street and you see these things which are called the Salisbury Crags. Because Edinburgh's uh, very... Uh, Edinburgh uh, has a mountain in the middle of it, which is, which is pretty cool. 
Uh, the university owns the, owns the terrace I live in. I, I live, you can actually just see, see. I'll show you a better view in a moment. That's my doorway there. The university owns it, and this is a key part of the story. And that's kind of nice for me because they... Um, uh, they, they, they paint the, the windows and they mend the roof and that's, that's pretty good and they, and they go home in the evening um, from their offices and leave the, leave the stairwell and at the weekends and they leave the stairwell deserted apart from my son who lives in the only other flat two doors up this is a view from, um, from the top of Salisbury Crags looking down on the same thing that we were looking at <coughs> long before and again you can, see, you, can, you can just make out my doorway there so very nice um, What's the problem? Well, the problem is, I'm going to show you. Here's, here's my, here, is my, here is the famous front door, and you can see this is full of university department uh, labels here. And, and there's a plaque there which tells you how historically important that building is in Edinburgh, if you were into the, the culture of, the, the way the culture of Scotland developed in the, in, the, in the 18th century. The problem is, well, here's the problem. And here is... Here is you have to listen quite carefully because actually it's really nice to get the sound with this, with this particular video. And we haven't any way of... Let me just turn it up as high as I can. This is my Amazon delivery man. Well, I'm a bit undisciplined for a change. And it's the weekend and nobody's in and... And the deliveries don't get made. What can I do about this? Well, the, 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 the key parameter is I don't own the front door. I've got no control over it. So, I mean, somebody sent me a link today to a, uh, to a nice new uh, smart device which you can stick on your front door, and it's an internet-connected doorbell, door push. So, so if, you, if you had control over that, and if you could get power to it, and if you could get it a, a connection to the internet, then everything would be... Then you could get... Your doorbell would ring on your telephone. Right. And actually, I think, they, I think they do a little bit better than that because I think they actually can manage to speak through this door, through the door push, through the bell push, to your phone. So that's quite cool. But I can't do any of that. This is what my entry phone looks like at the front door. This, this, this is this is a picture of the front door. So you can see that although this wasn't built in the 1780s, it doesn't look like it was built an awful lot later, right? And uh, and, and and the flat, in, in, that's the front door picture. And this is the picture in my flat. So lots of flats in Edinburgh have, have a similar kind of uh, have a similar kind of setup. When the um, when the the, uh, the 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 you can just see my name there. When that when the when the button's pressed, the, the visitor speaks into the uh, into the um, into the intercom here. I hear it there, and then I press that. Then I press that, and it operates a solenoid which opens the door. So it's the very opposite of what Hodor did. <clears throat> So it's, it's pretty straightforward, and it, and it didn't occur to me for a long time to do anything about, uh, about, about changing this in any way. So how does it actually work? Well, eventually I had the idea, well, I'll t just try pull up, pull up, pulling off the front of the entry phone, and sure enough, there's some wires behind there, and then you just try shorting these out at random, and in due course, you find that there's, there's two of them, uh, which, two in particular... Which when, you, which, when you short them out, will open the door. It's that closes the circuit that operates the solenoid at the, at, at the door. So, uh, so if you ask where's the connection between my Raspberry Pi, between the Raspberry Pi and my front door, that's the connection. The connection is these, the, the connection is these, these, two, these two terminals. So how can I get them to work? How can I get the Raspberry Pi to, to close them? It's really simple. It's really simple if you're not, if you're not, uh, if you're not a completely hardware ignorant person like me. I'm so hardware ignorant, I have to tell you, that when I first got this Raspberry Pi, I, um, I sort of saw that it needed a power supply and I found one from somewhere. And I saw that it needed a keyboard and a terminal, so I kind of wired those things in. And then I switched it, I, I powered it up, and I was just really disappointed when nothing seemed to happen on the screen. <laughs> I had to go to the local hobbyist, uh, the, the, the hack lab, and they said, and they said well, you, know, you have to give it an operating system. So I gave it an operating system, and things worked better after that. And then you go and, then you go and look up the uh, cookbook, Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi cookbook tells you exactly how to do just what I wanted to do. It's really the equivalent, in terms of complexity, it's really the equivalent of lighting an LED on a, on a, on a breadboard. It's the very first thing you ever do if you're doing any hardware thing with the, with the Raspberry Pi. It couldn't, be, it couldn't be more straightforward. You use something called, um, if you've got, you've got a high-powered device, you can't, 
um, you, you, can't, you have to protect the GPIO board of the Raspberry Pi from, the, from a 12 volt uh, power supply like what um, operates the solenoid on the, on, on the front door because the GPIO module of the, the GPIO um, uh, module on the, on the, the Raspberry Pi chip is, is unprotected and it's really, really, really easy to burn it out. So, and you can tell there's a voice of bitter experience talking here. This is not the Raspberry Pi that Oracle gave me. <laughs> I had to replace it. So, so all you have to do is use, use a, 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 um, a MOSFET, it's called. A, it's a really, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very cheap and easy piece of kit to buy. I think, I can't remember what they cost. A couple of, um, literally, um, 60 pence or something like that. Well, and, and then you, you, you need, you need um, a, a, a couple of resistors and you wire it up. And it's really straightforward. So that's my, this is my fancy hardware setup, which is actually here at the front. Right? So I've never got any further. I'm that interested in hardware. I've never got any further than doing that. So that's, the, um, that's the, the, the hardware part of the talk over. If I, if, if, um, if I can just manage to, to raise one of those GPIO pins, I'm going to, that's going to, uh, that is going to be the, that's going to provide the, um, the, the voltage needed on the gate of this, of, of this MOSFET to switch it so that the, so that the, in this case it's not a lamp module, but exactly the same thing will happen. Current will flow through the solenoid. The door will open. That's, yeah, job done. So that that, that ought to have been incredibly easy, and and I would su suggest to you that you will find it a lot easier, very easy indeed. So now what have we? Now the interesting part comes, well, it begins, which is the uh, which is how am I going to make this useful to my delivery man? Well. <clears throat> How many people, can I ask how many people here have a Raspberry Pi and have played with it a bit? Okay, so I'll go very quickly through the, through the, the, through the first stages because this is really pretty straightforward. You, uh, it, this, is what, this is the thing that I didn't know to, that I didn't know to do. You've got to, get hold of, you've got to get hold of an operating system for it. Raspberry is the, is the, uh, the Pi version of, of Debian, which I sort of know a little bit about. You get that. And you um, and you you stick the uh, flashcard into your computer, and you unmount it, and you do a bit copy of the image that you downloaded of the of, of Raspbian onto the um, on, onto the flash onto the, the card, the, the flashcard, and then you and then you eject it and you stick it into the Pi, and this time when you power it up, actually something happens. <clears throat> So I just, I just connected to the... I, I'm, I'm using a Mac, and uh, the Mac does internet sharing in a rather peculiar way, so you have to, you have to kind of um, poke around a bit in order to find out what, um, what, um, uh, address, what uh, address it's likely to give the, um, the, the, the Pi, because it, it, does a, it does a form of uh, funny form of DHCP. But I, I usually find it somewhere like that. <clears throat> and then all I have to do is configure, the, configure it, and actually configuring the Raspberry Pi, really the only important thing to do is just to um, set the date. That's about it, really. And now, you, now your Raspberry Pi is ready to go. There are, versions of the, there are versions of Raspbian that you can get and versions of other operating systems for the Raspberry Pi that you can get with stuff pre-installed that would do some of the job that I want to do here, but they never, they don't, the bits never fit together. The whole part of this, the whole difficulty of everything that I'm going to talk about here is not writing anything original. There's hardly any, I hardly wrote a line of code. Well, a few lines of code, you'll see them. But the, 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 the job is finding com the right version of all the different components that you want to fit together. <clears throat> so I've got the, um, so now I've got an operating system. I'm going to put Java on there because I'm a Java person, so that's the, that's the one thing that I do know how to do. This is pretty straightforward, actually. pi for j is really pretty, um, uh, pretty, pretty easy to install and pretty easy to use. So all I need to do is just, I, I, I get hold of it, I, I, I run update on, the, on, on Raspbian, I, 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 um, I, I open the, I open the, the, um, the Python chain package and, and I build it. And that, that's, all, that's all cool. <clears throat> and now, I, I, that's, it, things are so easy for me with Pi4j that I even have, as well, a, a Java program which does what I want, which is to, which is to raise the voltage on one of the, on one of the GPIO pins. So you'd think, you'd think I was just about there. I, um, I, I 
kind of fiddled it a bit in order to, so that we would get, um, so that we'd get a bit of a demonstration here. So this is my version of it, and you can see the, the important part of, I've, I've, I've emboldened here. And basically, what I'm, what I'm, I've called this my GPIO example, and all I need to do, and all I'm doing is just, um, so, uh, is just raising the pin, raising the voltage on the pin for. Uh, 800 milliseconds, as many times as, 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 a, as a repetition count, which is a, uh, which which, I, which you get from the from the command line, and then sleep for and sleep for a second. Right, so you heard it work. I think it's I think this is going to work. Let's actually do some. Um, let's get something to actually work if we can. So I am logged into the Pi here. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm even in the right place. Oh, so everyone's, can everyone see that? Um, oh, no, you can't, can you? Nobody said anything. You have to tell me when I do things like that, which is all the time. Um, so uh, am I, am I, I'm super user. So what, all I need to do is say java dash cp dot colon slash lib slash star my GPIO example. Right, and I get, to, I get to choose, or you get to choose, how many repetitions will we have? I want to do this just so you know. I'm, I didn't make, I'm not making it all up. Well, I have, this isn't all pre-prepared. Let's say two. Ah, right. Okay. Hmm. What's it doing? GPIO factory. Um, that's because I'm not in the right place. Oh, pi for Jane. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's a uh, demonstration. Oh, I know what's wrong. It... it I, have, I don't have a great record with demos. If you see what I'm doing wrong, please don't be shy to shout it out. It's always a triumph when anything works. It really is. I mean, every single one that works, I'm just so happy. Right. Um, so, now, I've, now I've, got, uh, I've got Java talking to, the, um, talking to the, the, the front door. So that's the start, I suppose. <clears throat> But it doesn't. But I can't really expect my uh, Amazon delivery man to um, to run a, to run a Java program from from the from the console here. So the question here now is, this is, and this is really the point, I suppose. What's the user interface? What am I going to use for the user interface? Well, there's a number of options for this. So I could give the I could let the delivery man or woman. I should be uh, gender gender neutral about this. I could let my delivery person uh, download a mobile app, for example. Uh, but you know. They're not going to do that, are they? I mean, in reality. That's a kind of quite a, quite a specialist thing to do. The, I could give them a web page, and that would be a lot easier. Maybe I could put a QR code up at the, at the front door, and I could say, scan this, and then that will take you to a web page, and then you, then you type a... Well, I'm going to have... Sorry, I should have said what my idea is. I'm going to give the Amazon delivery person some, a code, that, a one-off code that's going to get them into the... Um, that, that they can use to authorise the Pi to let them in the front door. I kind of skipped that rather important detail. That's the overall. That's the overall game. So, how are they going to get this code? How are they going to communicate the fact they've got the code? <coughs> Mobile app? I don't think so. Web page? Not really very usable either, because you know it's, it's a lot of messing about, and it's pouring with rain. Remember, in in in, in my imagined circumstances. So I really, the one thing that everybody always carries with them is a phone, and, and we're going to assume they don't actually have anything very elaborate in the way of a phone. Well, actually, what you could do is you could uh, use DTMF codes to get, to get a numeric code into the, in, in, uh, to the Pi to say, I'm really authorised. But, uh, I mean, that, that, would, that would have been quite practical, and actually I have implemented it. These demos often go wrong, so I thought, oh. So it's a backup. But what I thought, why don't we really, you know, kind of go the whole hog and do voice recognition? Because, you know, this is 2016. So if you want to do voice recognition, actually, if you want to do voice recognition or you want to do key codes, then you're going to need, uh, you're going to, need to get in from the public switch network onto, your, onto the Raspberry Pi, and you're going to need to have something that will take telephone calls on there. Something that takes telephone calls is a private branch exchange. That sounds like something you'd pay tens of thousands of pounds for, right? Actually, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, pr a private branch exchange free software, in inverted commas free, on the, on the, uh, available for Linux. It's called Asterisk. And in fact, you can get um, uh, versions of Raspbian that already have Asterisk installed on them. 
And in fact, I even tried to do that. So I'll, t- I'll talk a little bit about, about why, I, why I didn't go down that road in the end. Um, well, actually, I'll talk now about it. So asterisk is a really problematic system to use. It's the only private branch exchange that, that is, uh, that's an option for these kinds of situations. If you want to actually talk to your... Uh, to your um, to any Linux system, I think, you really, ha- you, really want to, you really want to use... If you want to phone it, you really want to use Asterisk. But although it's free software, it's free in a rather, um, in a rather well-defined sense. You can, every, everything you need in, to, to run it is in principle there, but they make it really difficult. It's really difficult to use. And people who've used Asterisk uh, that aren't as naive as me have confirmed that, I'm, that I wasn't imagining that. So the documentation isn't really very nice, and there are many different versions. It's evolved very rapidly. The documentation never makes it clear which versions you're, you're, you're using. Um, there's um, there's the, the, the one that they really try and draw you into, is something called Free PBX. Who wouldn't want something that was free? Free private branch exchange. And then you discover that most of the important management modules of that, it looks really nice, but most of the important management modules of that are actually very expensive. So it's pretty clear that the, uh, that the company that, um, uh, that develops Asterisk have a dual agenda. So you're getting the, you, get, you get the free software, but you also get a lot of problems with it. And consultancy, expensive consultancy, might be a really good way of uh, putting that problem right from their point of view. Has anybody used Asterisk here? Am I making this up? <laughs> okay, I'm not making it up. I'm making it up. Uh, I used this uh, three years ago as a government telephone system. So How did you find it? How find it? Mm. Just a recommendation. No, 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 I didn't mean that. I meant, ah, sorry, no, no, sorry. No, the, the English phrase, how did you find it, ah, means what did, uh, what did you find it was like? Pun? It worked for you. Okay, so maybe, there, may, there may be an element of my incompetence there, but that's what I found anyway. I still used it, don't get me wrong. I, I, um, I was admitted, and it, and it certainly does what you want, but the, but the problems that I just uh, talked about are all, are, are all on this slide. And yeah, well, that's right. The, 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 the typical problem you find is you want you say, oh, there's a Debian package for it. That's great. That means I don't need to I don't need to get the binaries and build it. I don't need to get the source files and build it. But you find that it's out of date, or rather, it's sort of up to date, but it won't. Um, but it but it isn't compatible with mo- other modules you're going to want to use, and so on and so on. So you end up installing it from source, and. That actually turns out not to be that hard to do. All you need to do is just find the right place to install it from, which, isn't, which they don't make particularly easy for you. But there you are. I've, 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 I've downloaded the source, I've, um, I've untarred it, I've, um, I've, I've run the preliminary scripts, I've, I've configured it, and finally I make it, and I make the samples as well. This is pretty important. So I think we're on to the next, we're on to the next demonstration because I now have a working... Um, uh, I've got a working uh, branch exchange software on here, and I can, I can telephone it. I can now telephone my Pi and, uh, and get it to do stuff, I hope. Um, so what do I need in order to telephone it? Well, obviously, uh, so far, the, the, I'm still working uh, in, a, in a kind of prototyping way. What I, what I, um, what I want to use is... Um, uh, soft phone. Well, I want to use I want to use a phone that's on the on the little network I've got here. So I'm going to use a so, uh, I'm going to use a soft phone that's actually installed on my on my machine. Uh, a, this, a soft phone is like it's this voice over IP. This is a voice over IP software. It takes your input from the microphone here and it contacts something on your local network. Um, if you give it oh sorry if you give it the um, is that right? Yeah, good. Okay, so here's Zoiper. Zoiper, Zoiper is this soft phone. And if I, um, I, I, I put a user on here, which I call Java Day Kiev. It's on extension 100. And if I look at the, um, if I look at the preferences for Zoiper, I see that, that Zoiper is going to connect to its, uh, to its server, to the VoIP server, on, um, it's expecting to find it that IP address. Normally, of course, it wouldn't be a... It would be a um, um, uh, your URL. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to be configured to have the username one. That's going to be the that's going to be the account name, as it's got a password, which you'll see in a moment is changed, please. And that's the uh, so that is the um, the user that Zoipa is going to going to um, uh, contact. So if we now go over to Asterisk, uh, we'll see we'll see how that stuff works. 
in the, um, in the asterisk configuration. The asterisk configuration is kind of pretty um, grimly complicated. So let's see, am I, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Okay, so let's just <clears throat> uh, log in. Mm. Um, uh, so, in the, if I go to um, the asterisk configuration files, I see that um, I've got something called uh, sip.conf. So, sip um, is the, um, I've forgotten now what it stands for. It's the, it's the protocol that's used for voice over IP. So, it's, you know, it's a protocol like the, um, like, um, um, uh, sorry, TCP or something, something of that kind. So it's on, so it's on top of IP, and it's it's a bit difficult compared to um, compared to many other IP protocols because it's, it, it uses two different ports. It's got a different port for all the for the ringtone if, it, when it, when uh, you're ringing in with a when you're making a call in and the voice channel. So that makes it really quite hard for something that I want to do later on, which is to tunnel out of my. Uh, I want to tunnel out from the Pi out to the telephone network, and I, it, you'd have to, you have to open quite a lot of ports on your firewall to get to, to get SIP to work. So the SIP uh, configuration. I've just gone to the bottom here, and I, I'm going to show only the uh, the one configuration um, uh, section that I'm interested in here, which is which is this one here. And you can see this is the account that we're going to that I'm going to be calling in at. You can see the, kind of the, the fancy syntax, it's very sophisticated, that it uses in order to define what's going to happen. When somebody comes in on account number one, then, then the type is frame, that's a security thing. The host is dynamic because we, know, we don't know necessarily where they're going to be coming from. Here's the, here's the password that they'll use to get into the account. And the context is something called open sesame. <clears throat> So, so what's the context? Well, the context is is a section in the um, um, in in the dial plan. So, what's the dial plan? The dial plan is a file called uh, extensions.conf, and this actually tells um, Asterisk what to do when a call comes in. So this is like this is where you would expect to find the scripts that drive asterisk. So it can do lots of things. When a call comes in, it can play. It can play hold music. It can route you to a different um, uh, to to a, to a different to some extension or other. It can accept DTMF uh, codes. It can do lots and lots of different things. It's a very fully figured piece of software. You can see the way that the, the kind of way that the script, the script works. So so the open sesame at the moment. It's going to say, well, when I get, if the extension is 100, then uh, the first step I want to do is I want to answer the phone. The second step I want to do is I want to call pseudo Java CP, oh, guess what, my GPIO example. And it's going to do it four times, and then it's going to hang up. So let's see whether we really have got uh, asterisk to, um, uh, to, talk, to talk to the, um, uh, to, talk, to talk to, talk to um, uh, sorry, let's, see whether I have got the, the, the phone to talk to asterisk. That's really what I'm trying to say. And I'm also trying to do things at the same time because I just commented out the, uh, the, the, this first demo. So let's get rid of that. And if this works, we should, uh, we, I should be able to dial in and, well, get, get I guess, four, four bleeps of the, of the phone. So four bleeps of the buzzer. So um, what I need to do is I've got to uh, reload the... I've, I've changed the dial plan, so I've got to reload it. Dial plan reload. Reload. Oh, um, but that's, because I, that's because I haven't started asterisk. Sorry. Um, I, I need to start asterisk, obviously. Uh, pseudo. All right, OK, asterisk. Actually, first of all, I'm afraid we have to talk amongst ourselves. I have to stop asterisk. <clears throat> because I, uh, because it starts off with the wrong, um, uh, the wrong startup arguments. Okay, so here, here it's going. And now, I, now I should be able to bring up my, um, bring up the phone, and let's see what happens when I try. Once asterisk has loaded itself, let's see what happens when I make a call on extension 100. You saw what extension 100 should is meant to do. Two down. Right. 
OK, so some, some of these work. You can actually see, this will be nice to see later on because this is actually giving us um, a, picture of what, a picture of what's going on in asterisk. Right, so now I've got, now I've got the, I can make a call and I can get asterisk, well, in this case, all, in this case, all I'm doing is, some, the script is very simple. All I'm doing is, um, I'm, I'm not actually uh, checking to see whether they've got an authorization code or, or, or anything like that. All I'm doing is I'm just checking that I actually can get from, the, from a phone to the, to the front door. And I can do that. But obviously that isn't enough because like, if, 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 that was in, if, if that was enough, then anybody could get in any time. And, and I want to make sure that it's only somebody who's got a code that I've, that I've pre-programmed that's going to be able to get in. So the next thing then is to think, well, how am I going to um, script asterisk so that, um, so that it'll do... Um, so, so that it will actually uh, authenticate uh, a user. So, how do you how do you how do you do that? Well, uh, you you write a dial plan is the answer. So here's a, here's an outline of the dial plan. The idea of the dial plan is that you're going to um, uh, I'm going to answer. I'm going to prompt for a code, and then I'm going to do stuff that's pretty obvious. Really, it's not very functional, which I, which I'm always saying is, is how you should be writing your code. But it's, but uh, the idea is still the same. I'm just going to I'm just going to loop, looking for a valid code. And go, I'm going to record voice input. I'm going to convert it to a recognisable format because none of the services will will accept it the way that Asterisk records it. I'm going to attempt voice recognition. If that's unsuccessful or if the code's wrong, then I'm going to I'm going to output a, a voice prompt and try again. I'm going to um, uh, it's, it, it turns out the script's a bit more complicated than this because I also included DTMF codes um, in case for a fallback, and I also provided different error messages in case uh, it, I just failed to recognise it, or or in case they'd um, uh, or in case they'd actually put in the number but got it wrong. Um, so so it's a bit more complicated, but that's the basic idea. How are we going to recognise speech? Right. So this is, this, this is the next problem. Well, there's a number of different options for that. A whole lot of different options. This is, this is what you find as you go down this path. All, everything's there for you. You just have to know, you have to guess which to choose. And I'm making it sound like I found the right path all the way through. But there's a lot of, I, I did a lot of backtracking. So you consider different things. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Offline, there's something called um, uh, CMU Sphinx, which is, very, which is kind of the state of the art. Um, uh, it, it has a keyword spotting mode, which would be particularly good for what I want, because I'm wanting to pick particular, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for digits, because um, I'm going to try and make it easy. I started off thinking I'll accept the words open sesame, but believe me, trying to get a voice recognition system to recognise the word sesame, which is very unusual in English, and it's not a runner, that, that didn't work. So I said, OK, well, stick with, with digits. And a keyword spotting mode would be pretty good for that. But I read, I mean, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I, but I, I saw that um, the, 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 the installation of CMU Sphinx, or Pocket Sphinx, on the Raspberry Pi is very memory heavy. It slows the Pi down. It's, it doesn't look like it's a good option, mainly because as, if, you go, if you go online instead of offline, you're going, to get the, you're going to benefit from the improvement of the services that are offered online. And of course, offline, then you, you're, going to have to, you're going to have to wait for people to implement that, to implement that, people at CMU, at Carnegie Mellon University, to implement new improvements and to download them and install them on the Pi. So online looks a bit better than, uh, than, having, to do, than having to do this kind of stuff. It's a bit better if it works. Oh, there's one other possibility. Asterisk, Asterisk has a built-in speech recognition module. But of course, it's not free. It's very far from free. So, so I didn't consider that very seriously. Online, the prop, perhaps I would, I would look again seriously now at the Google Voice APIs. I was doing this a few months ago. And this was just before um, Google had, well, at the time, everybody was us using Google Voice APIs. But they were undocumented. And so actually working out what, um, what parameters to provide to the REST interface was a matter of trial and error. And I got fed up trying and erroring, I suppose. Um, since then, Google have, um, have, got a, a, have actually published their voice recognition service. And I think, it's, I think it should be pretty good. And it's free for the moment to developers. So I would look at that, I would look at that again um, 
uh, quite seriously, but I would also consider that it's not going, necessarily going to be free forever. And Google don't have a great record of maintaining their, maintaining their, um, their software offerings. If they, if they feel that something's uh, not, not going in the right direction for them, they're pretty ruthless. So Google Cloud Speech API would definitely be an option, but I went with IBM Watson. And I've found that, and, I, and I've actually found that reasonably good. You can judge for yourself when, I, when we try it out. And, and I'm no doubt there are many other options, but th th this is this is where I where I went. Now the next question is: so now I know how I'm going to. I, I've got the basic building blocks for this whole thing now. I can I, I know how to control the, um, the 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 pie from Java. I know how to get voice recognition. I I, I don't yet know how to dial into this thing. That's, that's going to be a problem. So that's, that, that's a, a part of the puzzle that I haven't put together yet. But the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to script the dial plan so that, I actually, so that we can actually do voice recognition and, 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 operate the, and operate the buzzer. So how am I going to script the dial plan? Well, asterisk contains everything you need in the syntax that I showed you uh, uh, a little while back. But it's really horrible. The learning curve for asterisk is... You know, I like that nodding at the back. The learning curve for asterisk is steep and it's long and it's not pleasant. I mean, you don't feel like you're going down a path where you have nirvana at the end of it. It's not, it's not like learning to have it. Um, some products aren't free and you keep on stumbling across those. The documentation isn't great and there are a lot of different versions and it's really hard to work out what they apply to. The dial plan scripting language is, and, and the politest words I can say is, it's even less great. It's really not, not very nice at all. So I think a lot of people are using another language. So now you've got another, we've got another piece to the puzzle, which is really, which you really can't resist. And how are we going to get out to this other language? Well, they, they had something called the asterisk gateway interface, which if you're as old as me, you'll recognize from the early days of, in, of um, programming for the internet, which, they, because they had something called the common gateway interface, which was a really horrible thing that meant that every time you got a request in, you had to start up a process, something like a Perl engine, to, um, to, recognize, the, to recognize the user input. That's what AGI was. That, the AGI works in the same way. But fa so-called fast AGI sends an address to a server. It sends, it sends a request to a server that you've got running on the same machine. So you just start another Java process, send a request to it, get a response back. It's a, it's a bit more modern because it's not... You know, it's not uh, uh, message-based or anything, but it, but it, but it, it's kind of reasonable. So th there are lots of implementations of both of these. Uh, the one for Java actually only implements fast AGI. So obviously the Java the Java guys made a uh, made made a reasonable decision about that. So you're going to have to use fast AGI, which means setting up this server. <laughs> It, actually, it's, it's not too bad. Asterisk Java, another product that, uh, that, 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 um, that you need, another piece of the puzzle, is, is just a jar that you add to the, the Pi4j library. <clears throat> You're on a freestanding server. It's pretty easy. You just start it up. And then I thought, well, you know, like, what, what will I, um, how, will I, how will I script this? And I'm not, uh, I'm not a groovy person. I've, I've, I've basically, everything I, almost everything I'm talking about here, I learned about in order to get this to work. I mean, apart from... Apart from Java and a little bit of Unix, I didn't know much of this at all. But I thought, well, let's have a go because Groovy is a scripting language, and you don't. And since I'm going to be programming on the Pi, I don't really want to have to work with a big development environment. So let me try with Groovy, and that worked pretty well. So um, uh, let's have a demo, I think, because I've been talking long enough. So let me see whether I can actually make um, get Groovy to talk to the um, uh, to talk to the. Uh, to run the Java program that, that is my GPIO example, because that was really that was quite an important step for me. So um, it's but it, but it's but it's not it's not it's not really a big deal. Let me open another window on the on the Pi. I'm going to go to um, uh, right. So sudo su. I have to run. I have to run a super user all the time because um, to, to manipulate the GPIO pins, you have to you, ha you have to have you have to be super user on the Pi. So um, if I go into the, my Groovy library and under under oh sorry, if I go into my Groovy library there, then I can I've actually got a little Groovy script prepared um, called Run GPIO Example. <coughs> uh, which which you can see is really really elaborate. It says. <laughs> My GPIO example main three. So let me see whether I can make that work. Um, to, to, to make that work, I would do um, pseudo groovy 
uh, and then I've got to I've got to get the the right um, uh, I've, got, I've got to get the the, cl the class path right opt um, pi for j uh, and opt uh, opt pi for j lib so so the, uh, Pi for J, that's, that contains my, the doctored example, and that contains everything, all the Pi for J libraries. And now I, now I should just be able to, to uh, uh, I should now just be able to, uh, to run that. Maybe that will work. Who knows? Mm, just thinking about it. Uh, pi for J, op, Pi for J, op, pi, ah, right. You're still not telling me what I need to, um, what I need to, um, what, I'm, what I'm getting wrong. Any joy? Right, so I can now write a groovy script. This is good because I can send stuff from asterisk. I can send stuff from asterisk to, to, to groovy now. And I, well, a groovy script, we're getting onto, onto more, something more like home ground. I think it's, so feeling, it's, feeling a bit more, um, it's feeling a bit more homely now. Uh, where I really wanted to get away from the, um, from the atmosphere of, uh, of, um, uh, of asterisk. It just feels such a hostile and alien em environment. And you know, I'm just so much more relaxed with Groovy in Java. So, so I've installed Groovy, and, um, and I know now that I've got Groovy working and talking to, talking to Java. I have to figure out how to, uh, how to get asterisk to actually do the talking. So that's, this is actually another level of complication. In, in, the, uh, in the dial plan, I'm going to have to say, I want to, I want to use the AGI server. And this is the address. Remember, I said it's sending a, re a request to a, to a process that's running. And this, is the, this is the address it's going to use in order to, in order to, um, in order to contact the, um, the server the, the um, fast AGI server, <clears throat> which is running on port 4573 because that's the default port for it. And so what happens is that, uh, is that the asterisk sends this path to, to the default AG, AGI server. Default AGI server looks on its class path and it finds on its, on its class path uh, a file that it's, that it's hard coded to look for called fast AGI mapping properties. And that says, what script you've got to execute when you get a um, when, when you get a, a, a Groovy file, so or when you get a, when you get any file to to execute. Now, in fact, they're all whatever, however many different uh, files you wanted to execute, they'd all point to this because the Groovy AGI script. Well, I mean, I can show you the Groovy AGI script in a moment, and it, but it doesn't do very much. Basically, the idea, the idea of it is that it's just going to um, it's just going to dispatch the the arguments that it gets, which is the name of the Groovy file, and stuff that it gets off the AGI channel, and it's going to dispatch them to the Groovy scripting engine. So kind of, that's kind of relatively straightforward, though of course it's difficult to set up. The AGI channel is the stuff that, uh, is, is the way that Asterisk tells the, um, tells the executing program, the script that's executing, tells it lots of important stuff, like, for example, what phone number it was called on. I mean, stuff that hasn't got anything to do with, with, the, uh, with the actual, uh, um, with what the dial plan is doing, but it's parameters, basically, it's properties of the call. And this is the thing that's going to be, that's going to be uh, executed. And that will then go on, go on and run um, GPIO example, not groovy. So I'm not, going to, I'm not going to demo that because I'm getting a bit, uh, well, I have demos to do actually here. Yeah, I better, why not? Why not? Yeah. So, hmm. right, five minutes left for demos. <clears throat> And then I, because uh, and that, that'll work, I think. So, um, what do we do? Um, uh, <laughs> okay, so let's let's cut to the chase. I'm, I'm, I need to start up the AGI server. Oh, pi. Oh, I do, what 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 I what I really do need to do is show you the dial plan. I really need to do that. The so my my, di my dial plan. Um, that's to say the real one. So the real one is. Uh, okay, so uh, where is the real one? Um, it's open sesame dot groovy. B i open sesame dot groovy. Right. So. This is it. This, this is actually where, this is, I said I hadn't written any code, but I wrote a bit of code. So here's, the, here's some of the code I wrote. Here is the code I wrote. So in Groovy, this is saying what to do. 
basically. So it says I'm going to look for. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to say. I'm going to tell the, the user when they call to say the entry code. I'm going to. Um, I'm going to. Um, look for uh, found will be when I, if I've actually got a number. While the supply numbers are null, I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, just put out some diagnostic information here. I'm, I'll check to see because I might get DTMF codes if the demo doesn't work very well. Uh, but if the demo, but if the, but if uh, but if I but if I don't get a DTMF code, I'm going to get a. Um, I, I, if I don't get a DTMF code immediately, then I'm going to go and listen for. Um, I'm going to listen for a code. I'm going to send it for recognition to. Um, uh, I'm going to send it to, for recognition in a minute. To um, right down here, to to the Watson service. And I have to do the conversion first to a different format. And then I'm going to send. Then I'm going to send it to the Watson service. HTTP builder it turns out to be a little bit buggy, but there's some fixes. And then finally, I can finally I can send it, and I might uh, I might get back the results. Uh, I might get back some some uh, results here. And if the results aren't empty, then I may I, I, I map them each of the words that I get back into into digits. And if they and if we've hit the mark, it's all good. And if we haven't, we go back and start again. So that's that's roughly that's roughly the the the, the way it goes. I'll start the server off, and I will edit the. Uh, I need to edit the um, the dial plan, so because I commented out the the stuff I. Oops. Uh, right. Okay. And this is this is the one that I'm interested in. This version of the dial plan. Oh, look at the look at the improvement in the in, in the in, in the scripting. So you don't have to say uh, you don't have to say uh, extend here. You can now say same. You don't have to say um, uh, uh, you don't have to do the, the the steps. You can say n. And in one of the books on on asterisk, it, it 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 says it says really proudly in the unending in the unceasing quest for coding simplicity, we've made these improvements to the syntax. <laughs> So let's see what happens. Now I have got what you didn't see in that uh, in that Groovy script is that, I, is that I was going and looking in a dummy database for uh, for codes. Inputting the codes is getting the codes into the into the system. The, the author the authorization codes is actually the key security question. So I'm so I'm skipping over that. I'm just saying oh it's an exercise to the user. You you could write a little uh, web application which would accept. Uh, which would accept codes and say, you know, like, uh, I want this one to be used only once because it's a delivery man. I want this one to be available because it's my girlfriend. She's always going to need to get in or whatever. You could do that. And it's quite easy to do it in principle. But doing it securely, that's really the issue because obviously if someone can hack into that, they've got entry to your, they've got entry to your stairwell or possibly, possibly um, your flat as well. So um, uh, the, the, the one thing that isn't, the, there's only one number in that um, uh, Dummy database at the moment, and it's number two one three four six. Let's see what happened. Oh, yeah, I need to reload the dial plan. Yes, thank you. Because it's just um, right. Dial plan. Reload. Okay. Right. Please say your entry code now. Two, one, So we're not actually there yet, of course, because uh, I can't expect my delivery person to, uh, to get into the flat and operate a soft phone on my computer. That's hardly the point, is it? So what, he's, so what he wants to use is a mobile phone, obviously. And what should be stuck into this thing is a, yeah, yeah, is, is a, is a, is a USB modem. Right. Unfortunately, and actually that, actually that does work, but it, you need to get it to work in the country you're in. You need to get roaming on your mobile data. 
and I don't and I didn't have it, and we spent the morning trying to get a, a Ukrainian data SIM card to work in the, my USB modem. But I have to miss that bit out. But what I can do instead is show you what the results will be. So this is almost this is almost as good. Uh, we can skip over everything else and just get to. Well, so this is about access from the PST from the public switch network. Well. Um, there are there are different possibilities. I decided to go for a I decided to go for a dongle. You could try you could use uh, you could come in from what's called a SIP gateway, but I that won't work for me because I have to tunnel out through the university's routers. So they're not going to open ports on the firewall for me. And because of this complexity of SIP, how you have to have the tunneling, I haven't managed to get the tunneling to work. And I think it's kind of nicer to use a to use a USB modem anyway. So here is the point. Of the whole thing. Oh, it didn't work. Oh, shoot. Ah. I'm right, so let's just quickly. Ah. It's there. Damn. Sorry. Sorry. Ah. It wasn't on my screen. Damn. Right. Let's try again. Uh, right. <clears throat> is it coming up? Here it is. Here it is, finally. So that's the story. Oh, I should, I should show the credits, because um, really. <laughs> oh, we are, we're out of time for questions. I'm very, I'm very sorry. I, I, I ran over. I ran over. But obviously, if you want to talk to me about it, you're very welcome. <laughs>